So let's start. My name is Oli. Um, pleasure to have you here. Um, I work for Canonical, which is the company behind Ubuntu. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, one of our products, which is an, a phone that we're currently doing. Um, I just brief overview about myself. Um, spent all my career in Linux. Been working for SUSE. Um, SUSE was acquired by Novell, so that brought me to Lehigh. Met my wife here uh, to Utah. Met my wife here, and now I'm just living here, uh, up in Lehigh. I'm enjoying it so far. Um, joined Canonical a couple of years ago um, to help start that that project, the phone. Um, so it's kind of cool to be here and talk about it because that's what I do every day. Um, and my wife is really happy that I find somebody else to actually tell it. <laughs> so, um, for those that aren't familiar with Ubuntu, um, we're essentially a Linux distribution and operating house, uh, operating system house. Um, founded in 2004, we have about 650 and more people counting. We hire quite a bit. Um, we have main offices in those locations, but in engineering, most everybody just works from home. So my commute in Lehigh rocks 30 seconds from bedroom to my office. Um, that's really good. Um, the company is quite diverse. We have um, 30 plus countries represented. And so you know we, we rock the telecommuting and working from home across time zones, across cultures, and stuff like that. Um, quick overview of what we do. So um, on the PC side, um, we're the third most installed operating system, uh, 25 million plus users. Um, as we do open source, it's really important for us to do, to be invested heavily in, in the open source community, developer communities, um, but also translators and you know local uh, locos and all that. Um, but as any other Linux distribution or commercial Linux distribution, um, one of our big businesses is um, the PC business. Oops. Um, we have about 40 million ship PCs that came installed with Ubuntu, which is quite good. Um, and we do this with partners like Dell, HP, Lenovo, Acer, Asus, and all those guys. Now, the idea that I'm trying to rep um, introduce you to here is um, the future, what we call the future of personal computing. Um, Mark Shuttleworth, when he started the company, um, he set out that you know he wants to change the world how people interact with computers, and so um, over the years he has developed designs and technologies with his team, and then um, that allow us to do two p big pillars in, in that um, approach. One is software convergence, where you have the same look and feel, the same elements, the same. Um, interactions with the system regardless of what kind of device it is. So we show, you know, phone, <coughs> from a phone to a tablet to a PC up to your TV, um, you know, and we have the same design language, the same behavior there. So that's software convergence for us. It's really like the same user experience across the board. Obviously, it's not just a verbatim copy of, of your shell elements across um, those form factors. They're adaptive. Um, you don't necessarily you know, want your liberal office shown when you're in TV mode and want to just consume a video. Um, same for on your phone. So there's just certain restrictions. But then there's also hardware conversions, and those that follow Ubuntu a little bit closer uh, might have heard about the Kickstarter campaign we did about a year, one and a half years ago, um, where Mark was pitching like a high-end phone, would have been like in the 800 to 1,000 dollar, just like hardware price um, area. Um, Back then, it was hardware a spec that you know we envisioned to come four years or so further down the road, um, but we wanted to just shortcut that evolution, um, you know, through a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and so, what we wanted to do here is, if you look at your phone today, um, you know, quad cores, octa cores. Um, Qualcomm is working on whatever 16 0 cores it is. Um, Gigabytes of RAM, you know, lots of s enough storage, not lots, but you know, fast storage in there. And so, hardware conversions for us is why, you know, if you have so much power in your pocket already as a phone, why carry a laptop when you come here to speak, right? Why not just plug in an HDMI cable and present it right from your phone? When you travel, I travel quite a bit, you know, why not just go to the hotel, plug it into your TV, 
do whatever you have to do um, you know, work-wise there, or go to your office and just plug it in at your desk um, to your periphery and your, and your display. And so that's, that's what hardware convergence is for us. And uh, I can show you like a glimpse into the future um, how, we, how we get there later on. Um, I brought a couple of devices. We are small enough of a group here so we can make it um, interactive. So if you have questions, you know, feel free to ask anytime. I plan to leave sometime, hopefully at the end. Um, typically, I just get too passionate and go way over. Um, but I also have devices here, um, so if you want to get like hands-on experience, you know, feel free uh, to come and do this. Um, all right. So why why yet another operating system? You know, there's Android, there's um, iOS, and, and others. Why? And so one of the things um, that we're trying to address is. Um, it's manifold, but if you think about like how money is being made with with mobile devices, it's you know to some degree a really thin margin on the hardware that you sell, but not a lot. You won't get rich there. Um, and then as a developer, you get some money if you sell your app, but you know 30 percent, 40 percent, or whatever go to Apple, go to go to Google. You know I don't know what the ref share model is specifically, but you know you get a little bit, but not all of it. Um, and then as the end user, I'm just on the paying end of this whole equation, um, so I don't get any money out of it, obviously. Um, and then there's Google and Apple that sell their services. You know, it's a platform to just push their services. Um, they generate web traffic. They have paid services to so the stores. Um, you know, that's that's how they actually like make a lot of money. And so, if you, as a hardware vendor, you're pretty much locked into that ecosystem, you won't be able to, to get into um, the Apple ecosystem because that's closed and dominated by Apple. And if you want to go the, the Samsung route or the, the Android route, then Android is free, but you know, it's yours to keep, yours to maintain, yours to bring up, you know, it's all yours, and you still end up using, in the first place, all the Google services. Right. So that's that's another um, barrier in, in that ecosystem. That's right. Um, so um, we are positioning ourselves as an uh, alternative operating system, where um, you, as an operator, for example, can integrate your services easily into our platform. We have a concept of frameworks that allows you to implement your messaging service or your stores um, as you wish um, without having the hassle of maintaining that whole operating system stack, for example. Um, on the end user side, so what's in there for me, what's in there for you? Probably none of you is a hardware manufacturer or an operator. Um, we were looking at like how are people using their mobile devices these days. and. Um, regardless on which operating system you're at, you have a grid of apps, maybe a gadget or you know some weather forecast, calendar widget, um, but that's about it. What do you do? You do social media, you play games of whatever kind, you browse, and that's I think the three big buckets of of how you use a smart device these days. And then there's you know instant messaging. You could fold, roll it into social media and so on and so forth. But the experience is really bad, right? If you want to consume content and information, be it Facebook or be it a website, um, you have to start the respective application. You have to go into the Facebook app to see what, what's going on with your friends, you know, same with Twitter. And so it, it's rather fragmented. And so we try to provide um, a mechanism, um, a design that allows for you as a user to aggregate data in a, in a better way and have it right front and center on the phone on instead of having an, a grid of apps which is kind of useless you have information there that's relevant to you and we give you ways to customize it and personalize it um, that is also a strong um, argument for operators so all of a sudden their service can be right at the center stage you don't have to have the Google search bar right there you know it's 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 yours to customize um, and for a developer it's an easy way, and I'm showing this at four o'clock, I think, today, um, like to, to get your content onto 
um, one of those devices. It's it's trivial. It's based on C++, but then there's ways around it how you can like, and I will show it hopefully if everything works okay at the hour session at four o'clock. How to do this? Excuse me, in like ten minutes. Um, so you have like one of those data aggregators up and going. Um, and so the way how we implement that is through what we call scopes. And so what you see here is a bunch of scopes. Um, and that's essentially the, the screens you see on your phone, right? So um, there's a dashboard view where you can have you know, your actual date and time, um, whatever is going on, on your, in your day today, um, and you know, weather forecasts, meetings, whatever. Um, something that integrates like a location service is what we call the nearby scope. Um, so based on your location and like your mood, um, you know, you get suggestions as to what restaurants, bars, movie theaters, and so on and so forth. And you can, as you see, um, like have, so that's the aggregation that you see here. So there's one data provider, which are restaurants, and then there's, you know, Yelp as a data <laughs> provider, and so on and so forth. And then the same applies for, you know, other topics, and that's really up to you as a developer, like how you want to implement that. Um, as a as a user of that system, you can customize the the sources that you want to, to see. Um, you know, here you like well, I mean, UGL weather is mostly good anyway, so I don't need the for weather forecast. Uh, you know, can just um, uh, disable that. Um, you can add additional sources to it, and so on and so forth. Um, and we call it, so the, the marketing name is Life at Your Fingertips because like all the relevant in information is just right there and you swipe through it. Um, so that's another example for um, aggregation scopes. Um, so on the music scope, for example, what, what do you typically have? You have local music on an SD card or on the device itself. Um, but then, you know, you might, I watch quite a lot of music videos on YouTube. Um, and then there's you know other sources like Groove Shark and SoundCloud and whatnot, and so on the music side you have like access to your local music um, in a horizontal um, layout, and then there's a vertical laid out um, SoundCloud um, scope, and down here you see you know the remainder of the Groove Shark scope. Um, the interesting thing about scopes is that each data provider is implemented as its own scope. So if you go down here, um, and I can show you later, um, you'll actually like, will have a full screen experience of that data provider. So SoundCloud in our experience, in our example. Um, but then for a developer or for a user, you can actually like aggregate those individual data providers into like one dashboard type of view. Um, and that same applies to um, the video scope and the shopping scope, and you know, it's the same concept. Now, that's all great so far, maybe, but if you have a brand, you don't want to look at your application or your data to look like Ubuntu, right? So far, this was a, an Ubuntu design theme, right? Um, you want to look at, want it to look like your your brand, and so. Um, scopes have actually the capability to allow you um, for branding um, and there's various options that you as a developer can implement um, on top of the layouts that I mentioned before. Um, this is just a selection of, of scopes that are already there. Obviously, um, or maybe not so obvious, starting a new operating system is heavily dependent on your app ecosystem. Um, when we started it, we knew we had this uphill battle to fight that it's the chicken and egg problem, right? There's no user of the phone, so why would I develop my application for that platform? There's no app on the phone, so why would I use it? So that's this downward spiral. And so um, we made it really easy to, without having to go through like the, the investment, time and money um, of writing a full-blown app, you know, we gave you scopes, um, which is an easy way to um, get content from your app that might be running in a cloud or so onto the Ubuntu platform. Um, that's essentially just the summary of what I said. And so I touched already like based on the developer experience. Um, 
So scopes is the key proposition for you as a developer if you want to get onto the Ubuntu platform. Um, and keep in mind, this spans from small screen phone device up to TV. Um, you know, your scope will run across all those form factors, across all those platforms. Um, so um, scopes is the entry point here for you. Um, as I said, I hope later to show it in about 10 minutes how to, to get a scope up. I'm going to do a Twitter a scope that will show all the tweets that have the Open West um, handle. Um, so it should be really easy. Um, it's front and center, so you are on the prime real estate on your device. Um, and so that's, that's our you know, recommended way forward. Um, the next way in trying to address or increase our <laughs> app ecosystem, obviously there's like this whole slew of HTML5 apps out there. And so we provide containers that are integrated with the shell and the rest of the operating system um, that allow you to bring on your HTML5 app you know, with very little effort. Um, and it's performant. We have, yeah, I should be able to show like Cut the Rope, which is an HTML5 app uh, running on the device. And you know, it took us like a day or two to get it over. So not, not, not overly hard. Then touching base on the operator aspect. Um, so that's what I mentioned earlier, frameworks, um, where you can integrate your cloud services, your storage, your identity, um, you know, and we provide your interfaces to do that. And finally, I'm not sure if I agree that it's number four. Maybe it doesn't imply a specific order of preference, but native QML is um, another strong point. Um, when we were starting to do the phone and lay out the architecture, we did an inventory of like technologies that are in Ubuntu or were in Ubuntu back then. And as any traditional Linux distribution at 2011, you know, there was X involved, there were parts of GTK involved, and you know, Glib, GNOME, whatnot. And then we started our own desktop shell, which was Unity, we call it 7. It's the current version that you see like right on my laptop, um, which was implementing its own toolkit that we were like investing in um, it was an OpenGL toolkit. It was all nice, you know, good good graphics, but from an architectural perspective, not up to par on with regards to scalability, right? So porting that over to to an ARM platform um, was difficult. Um, allowing us the flexibility in the design that I mentioned earlier, so the adaptive design um, was not necessarily trivial. So we made a hard decision. Um, yeah, like three years ago, and say, screw it, you know, we're going to do it right. We're going to go um, with Qt QML, which was, you know, an established technology back then. Um, QNL, QML, if you're not familiar with it, is a JavaScript similar type um, <coughs> declarative language, which can be extended through um, C++ plugins. So if the language in itself, the native language, doesn't allow you to do everything you need to do, or if you need to access parts of the platform that aren't exposed through that QML API. You can just write a C++ plugin and access um, you know, those parts that are missing. Um, so the reason why I said I'm not sure that I agree with native QML being number four is because the whole shell, the phone shell, the, the user interface is written in QML, which to me goes as a strong point as you know, the maturity of that technology and the scalability of that technology. Um, along with those decisions, we also um, got rid of X um, and implemented our own display server um, just because we thought of X as something, you know, written 30, 35 years ago. Mainframe in mind had a client server concept. That's all good. But, excuse me, it's just this big beast and, you know, extensible um, with, you know, broken plugins. And so it, we just thought, like, we need a clean approach that scales on EGL platforms and, um, x86 platforms and so on and so forth. So that's why we ended up writing our own display server and that has done us good so far because we were able to go like really fast. You know, the bring up of the first device with um, the display server and the shell was done in a matter of months. And that means rewriting the whole shell. So not a small task. I've lost my pointer. 
So for developers, um, we talked about those four areas. Um, we're really strong in supporting communities, building communities. And so developer.ubuntu.com is a central hub um, for you as a developer for anything Ubuntu, and then specifically like for the devices. Um, where we provide you not only with um, like best practice guides um, um, and, and links to the SDK and documentation, but also like the app design guides. I get often asked like, is it possible to install GNOME on top of it? Um, you know, or can I install KDE or whatever? Because that's just the, the shell I like, that's the user interface I like. And technically it's possible we don't lock those, those, those environments out. Um, but again, coming from the perspective of trying to achieve software convergence, having the same look and feel across all the devices, we don't really, um, you know, and suggest you do that, right? It's, we, we're working hard on giving you that, that unified experience. And so um, technically it's possible, but we rather, you know, have you stick to those app design guides. Um, to make sure that the user experience, if you're an app developer, is, is consistent across all those form factors. Um, and that's it in terms of what I have brought for slides. We're halfway in. And I said I have the, um, the devices here, so I'm going to can run you through the devices and show them to you. Um, but maybe it's a good time to see if there are any questions so far. Yeah. Um, about scopes. Uh -huh. Are they just are they mainly meant for just consuming content or like yes. like the Amazon scope? Would you be able to buy something from that or just um, how would that how does that work? Yes and no. So you can interact with a scope. So the app scope, for example, you'll be able to install and uninstall. So there's actions that you can trigger. Um, but I don't f the like in the Amazon example you brought up, we won't be able to trigger the purchase. You like right there in the scope. What will happen is you get to your list of items that the search returned. Um, you choose the item that you're interested in, and then there's a, a preview of it. Uh, let's see if we have a Don't have anything. Um, then there's a preview of it, and then if you, just, you know, want to take further actions, it'll take you to the browser, to the product page at Amazon, and you can just purchase it right there. So um, our, our display server is called Mir. Um, Mir, like the space station. Um, and that's a project we started in 2012, I believe. Um, and the toolkit that we're using, so other than GTK, the, the other big toolkit in Linux is Qt. Qt. Um, and so that's what we're basing all of our um, design on. So you Unity 8, so like the, the next version. Not the one that you currently get with 15.04, but um, the, the successor of that is written. And the, the one that's running on the phone is, is QML. So can people actually buy some provider's phone right now and hook it up with this? It's running your so stuff and hook it up with the provider, whoever they are? Um, yes, so one of the phones that I'm going to show is this one. It's a Meizu MX4. Uh, it's a Chinese um, OEM that will start selling in Europe um, in the next couple of months. We're just like finishing the, the RC image for it um, today. Um, and then this guy here, and I, I can use it here. Like it's, you know, works on, um, I have a T-Mobile since, I don't know which band they use, but you know, can, I can use it on AT&T T-Mobile. And this is the first device we shipped, which is a BQ phone. Uh, it's a Aquarius E4.5, so I had to cheat. Um, and that was selling in Europe out of Spain. It's a Spanish company, BQ. Um, so you can buy those. Um, the problem with this is um, the bands don't line up, so you get edge. So you, you, the data, you know, it sucks when you're uh, out and about. And I used this. I dog f was dog fooding that for like a year while we developed it because that was um, our target commercial target platform um, for. You as an interested developer, um, we have 
currently support the Google Nexus device uh, family. So Nexus 4 and Nexus 5, where the Nexus 4 is currently the officially supported, canonical supported um, device. Problem is, like, they're not available anymore to buy you know, from Google, so you'd have to go to eBay or so and buy them used. We're currently trying to figure out like, what's the next target platform. But the Nexus 4s, you, know, you can buy them there, not locked into an, uh, an operator, and you can just you know, start using that. And as I said, the MX4 will become available in the US later this year. <coughs> Good. All right. Let's see. Dunk camera. Mm -mm. All right. Um, so I'm going to walk you through just like the design elements the, um, that that make like the key user elements um, of the phone. This is my phone that I use privately right now, so there yeah, might be private stuff on there. So please, uh, yeah. Don't laugh at, at pictures my daughter took um, that might be embarrassing. Um, I'm probably not going to show the BQ one. It's just it's the same user interface, the same experience. Um, but I brought it so if people want to, you know, use it themselves, t get in, test it later on. You know, happy to do that. And then I also have uh, the second generation um, Google Nexus 7 tablet with me um, that shows you the transition or like the similarities of the user interface between the phone and the tablet. And then I'm hoping to show like a convergence feature where on the side of the hardware convergence where this device could actually power your desktop workload. Um, let's see, I'm not so sure if the setting up the demo at 1 a.m. last night was a good idea. All right, so let's get started. Um, let's see. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. All right, so we have 17 minutes left. Um, what you see is the lock screen um, with an infographic. This is individual um, to... Somewhat blind, sorry. Oh, okay. Come over here. Um, this is unique to myself. Um, it is, you see, I've received one call, which was the wife, you know, making sure I, I made it down okay. Um, I made one call saying, hey, you know, I just got your message. It's all good. And you see, like, how... The, the bubbles lay out differently, and this is very individual. There's no other device that has the same, um, you know, end first screen as this one because it's just based on what, how I, you know, what I was doing today. It's a gimmick. It's not a big selling point, but it's kind of cool. Um, on top, you see um, indicators and other elements of the shell, um, but let's just unlock it real quick. So, so that interface is that something that's completely customizable? So if you didn't want like bubbles, but you like that idea that you know, it's like yeah. I don't know, stars or yeah. So that's that's one of the um, branding elements in the operating system that you as a OEM or as an operator could use. Um, I'm not sure to what degree you could replace the bubbles by squares or so. And early on I thought we had um, plans to do that. Um, it's, it's, it's all done in SVG, so it it's, should be customizable, but the, the interest was little, so I'm, we haven't pursued that too long. Um, so that's the secret password. Um, so what you see first is the, the app scope um, on this device, and that's that too Can we turn the lights off in the room? Whoa. <laughs> nope. And the phone. Let's see. Yep. There we go. All right, thank you. All right. <laughs> that kind of spoils the presentation. Uh, let's see. <laughs> All right, so it's a scope, right? Because 
that's all you will see on on your on your devices scopes and that's the app scope so initially I was sort of belittling the app grid but at the end of the day you still want to have access to your apps right whether or not you want that front and center or you know on one of the other screens that's up to you um, but I want to talk about like the the shell elements first for a little bit so um, on top we have the indicators and you already saw like some of the magic there so just traditional pull down but then what's kind of nice about it is um, you can actually with a, a horizontal swipe I'm just trying to not move the device too much go between the different indicators um, so date and time battery you know commit turn it off because that's a good idea to do during a presentation anyways um, you know and then you just dismiss the indicator and so we have like um, in addition to accessing like notifications you can access like key attributes of the respective indicator so like volume or brightness right there rather than having to go into settings and you know do that so we also try to surface that um, straight um, for you um, now on the right uh, left side sorry that's kind of difficult to not move the phone um, is the launcher um, and so that's that's just your traditional quote unquote taskbar, right? So that's where you have running apps. Um, that's where you have shortcuts to the apps that you put there. Um, you can pin them, and then you have what we call the BFB, the big fat button, uh, which will always take you home. And you define what home is. In my case, it's the app scope. So, um, but it's always like your anchor point. You know, if you're lost somewhere in the system or somewhere writing in Gmail uh, an email need to go back you know that's the shortcut to just get you right there um, and then you know it scales as I said so that was one of the considerations you could add more you know we have people in our teams that have like 30 apps pinned and I'm like <laughs> I'm more on the minimal side so I use a browser and my mail and that's about it well Tetris um, but anyway so you know it, it, there's a good design there it's, it's very responsive um, so that's that's the left side, um, and then generally, like we use what we call edge swipes. There's there's different types of swipes in, in that system. So to navigate between screens, you would just do like a regular swipe as you're used to it. But then to invoke like the launcher and and other elements, you that's kind of tricky right now. You gotta come over the edge or not and invoke those elements. And so you like have to come over the bezel, and then the system will detect that edge swipe. That's for you to express the intention. I want to access, you know, special functionality that's not part of an app. Um, so on the, let's just start a browser real quick. It makes the next part a little bit more interesting. The launch is always on the left side. That's part of our design language. That, it, regardless of which plat um, device type, it's always on the left side. <coughs> Um, now, you see, or, or maybe not, a button down here, um, but we typically do without hardware buttons. So like on Android, you have, I think, down to three these days. Um, our design does not require hardware buttons. And so that allows you to use more of the screen. You know, you can put in a bigger screen as an OEM. Um, so it's, it's one of the considerations, because we assume that screen real estate is really what people are after and so as an OEM you can make that decision um, but one of the um, selling points for an OEM is that typically when you when you bring up a device the hardware enablement cost is one of the biggest items in your in your bomb right um, so our proposition is that the way how we've architected the system, it's not running Android. So we're booting an Ubuntu Linux kernel, but in order to access hardware, we're in an LXC container, bring up um, Android and their drivers, and then have uh, through lib hybris, um, an interface to access those drivers from our uh, kernel or user space. And so, that's very attractive for you as an OEM because all of a sudden you can sell that device with Android, which you most likely do anyways already, and you can put Ubuntu on there, and there's like a 99% um, guarantee that you know y there's no additional 
work to be done for you in the bring up. The 1% that I kept um, is typically where we have to be bug compatible with the respective Android driver. You know, the software um, has certain behavior that they just build around or haven't discovered yet. And so um, just the way how our stack works might trigger such a bug, and so that's the 1% line. But generally, um, you know, that's a very compelling feature or argument for um, an OEM. So now I've started an application, um, but really I want to you know, see what apps I have currently running. Um, so a right edge swipe um, would then invoke the, the switcher. Um, and Tetris is really nothing I want to do here during the presentation. And I don't want the browser, and so I come back to just my, my scopes. Um, now let's talk about scopes a little bit. So that's the nearby scope. I don't think I got a GPS lock, because it's turned off. So I know I didn't get one. Um, does a smart guessing based on your IP as to what's around you. Um, and so um, here are the data providers you know, that, I, that I have in the nearby scope. Um, and let me just see. Um, once, you know, if, if the location service was enabled, I, I would get like the local weather and, and events going on, like uh, um, the Open West Conference. So this is music, um, you know, kind of interesting taste for music, I suppose. Um, I haven't enabled um, any, any um, online source, but I can now dive into the respective artists get that um, preview we were talking about in the Amazon question, um, and um, you know get get here. I think the device lost its internet co yep, connection. Um, that's why we don't get any any pictures at this point. Um, not sure if anyone wants to access that, but you get the idea. Um, and so this is the aggregating music scope. Um, that has, as I showed earlier, like my music, the local music, and then would have YouTube, GrooveShark, and whatnot. And so I'm diving into here now, through the Chevron, into the data provider, my music, and then that lists um, all those those albums and artists I have here. Now, I want to customize it a little bit. So those are the data sources that I could enable for them for the music scope. Um, you know, I'm personally a big fan of SoundCloud and GrooveShark, so you know, I would probably just disable that. And um, the scope would refresh, or well, does refresh, as you've seen down here. And you know, it's kind of a bummer that the network left, uh, went down. Let's see. Anyways, um, now talking about customization, right? I, I told you, like, you as a user, can customize the data that you, you're seeing. And so we do this from a bottom um, swipe. And so you see, you've seen the app scope, if you remember, and then we went to the nearby scope and then the music scope. And so this is, the section here are the scopes that I have in, like visible, accessible in the system. Um, um, but really, I was sort of belittling the app scope, so let's put that at the end. I don't want that app grid there for my next presentation. So I just dropped it down, and then um, all of a sudden, you know, the, he, up here you see the stack of scopes, and nearby is now the far most, the, the left, most left um, scope. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of like what other scopes we have available um, on the phone as well. Um, you know, it's Fitbit integration, which my wife strongly recommends I should just enable, um, you know, and other things, um, other scopes, other data providers um, that you can use. Good. Um, at this point, I would hand the device over to you and, like, shows like Mobile World Congress and so on and so forth. Um, so I think we have five minutes left in the official session. Um, if you have questions, you know, I'm happy to answer them. If you want to try, oh, I wanted to show you the, this actually, um, the tablet. Um, but we're getting to the point where we will probably have to, you know, feel free to come up, um, also take answers. It's not too bright. Question, sorry. Uh -huh. So the specs on the phone, are they, are they comparable to some of the current smartphones? It, it, it looks like it's, it's moving very smoothly. Yeah. Um, so, like for productivity, things of that nature. 
uh, yeah, um, it, it does. So the this is a really low end. Well, at the low end of the medium <laughs> um, sector, um, it's not really powerful, and you can check it out, and it's like really smooth. Um, powering like I wouldn't necessarily compile on it in, in the sense of like you know hardware convergence plug it in and use it as your developer station um, but to run like your productivity suite or a browser those devices are just well equipped and we don't require like a beefy machine right yeah you said this would run on 99% of phones is that uh, where you go home and install it on 99% no, no, I didn't say 99% of the phone. I said if we want to put all the Ubuntu onto your phone, there's a 99% chance that it will just work. Um, there's enablement work to be done on our platform side. So um, we have a long list. I think that's the key question, like which devices can I try it on? So on developerubuntu.com, there should be um, a long list of supported devices. Um, we use a similar hardware enablement approach as Cyanogen Mod. Um, and so those communities, the Ubuntu community and the Cyanogen Mod community, were working closely together. And so we were able to bring up, well, the, the community was actually able to bring up, like, within months, like 20 or so devices just right there. So that's, you know, just speaks for that choice of architecture. Um, so that's the tablet. The biggest difference to the phone, um, you have a little bit more screen real estate. Um, and so, let's see if I can get it up. Nope. You should be able, but I'm not. Um, we have a side stage, what we call a side stage. Um, so, you know, it's nice to see your app grid a little bit larger, but it doesn't really like benefit you as a user. And so, what I can't show right now, because of greasy fingers, buggy software, or just Murphy, is you would swipe over the edge and then come up with a side stage, a side window that has the same aspect ratio as a phone app, and then like your like simple applications like calculator and you know notes could just live here in the in the side stage, and that's sort of the first attempt to multitasking because on the phone so far you only have a single app full screen all the time, right? That's all you get on a tablet, slightly bigger screen, so you could get you know a first glimpse into um, multitasking. Now let's see. Um, if I can end this talk with a success or failure, convergence. So plugging, plugging the device in and then have it, you know, bring up, switch from a single windowed full screen mode to a window desktop mode um, is something I want to show here, and I hope it works. What I'm doing is I'm there's a Bluetooth keyboard, and nothing says, you know well-prepared presentation more than a 5 a.m. Walmart run in the search for <laughs> a Bluetooth device. Um, so let's see how it works. But it's currently turned off. I'm turning it on now uh, in the hope it will pair with the device. And then it should actually switch into windowed mode. And so now, you know, appealing to your imagination, add an, a screen to it that you connected through HDMI. And all of a sudden, you have, um, you know, your windowed mode as you need to have it on your big screen um, desktop. Um, so that went well. And I can try to spoil it now by like trying to switch back. Uh, that'll take a little longer, uh, but we'll see how it goes. But I think that's a good segue into like taking questions and inviting you to come up if you want to just give it a try. Yeah. Thank you. So let's see.